I was so excited for my conversation today that I had my microphone off and in 234 COVID calls, it's the first time I've done that and I'm going to start again and I apologize for the uh, technical glitch there and I'm gonna start again from the top. You know if you've been watching that this is COVID calls and this is the 234th of the COVID calls. I'm Scott Gabriel Knowles. My conversation today is a discussion of COVID-19 in Portugal with Joao Machado, Inés Navalias, Tiago Sariva, and Hugo Soares. You can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live, Twitch, and Periscope. And of course, you can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. As of today, March 5th, 2021, there are 2,576,079 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 16,458 deaths reported in Portugal from COVID-19, 261,000 in Brazil, and 674 reported in Mozambique. It's a way to bring some humanity to the numbers. I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Maria de Souza, leading Portuguese scientist, dies at 80. The author is Rafael Minder, and this was published July 2nd, 2020 in the New York Times. Maria de Souza, one of Portugal's leading scientists, first made her mark with research in immunology while working in Britain and the United States. But after two decades abroad, she returned home with two goals, developing a national program of science education and creating a better understanding of hemochromatosis, a hereditary disease especially prevalent in northern Portugal, in which the body absorbs excessive amounts of iron. Dr. D'Souza died on April 14, 2020 at a hospital in Lisbon, she was 80. The cause was COVID-19, according to the Institute for Research and Innovation in Health at the University of Porto, where she was a professor emeritus. Marcelo Rebelo de Souza, the president of Portugal, paid homage to Dr. de Souza's scientific accomplishments and broad vision of the world, which was not limited to academia, but instead embraced with enthusiasm the relationship between knowledge, society, science, and the arts. Again, this article comes from 2020, and those were the president's words at that time. She managed to become a prominent woman scientist at times when it was even harder than now, said one of her former students, Rui Costa, who is the director and chief executive of the Mortimer B. Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute at Columbia University. Her efforts to train a new generation of Portuguese researchers, he added, was really like a national scientific revolution. Maria Angela Brito de Souza was born on October 17, 1939 in Lisbon. Her father was a naval officer and her mother a homemaker. She received a medical degree in 1963 and then left for Britain to continue her studies, making a rare move overseas during Portugal's dictatorship. She earned a doctorate in immunology at the University of Glasgow and then came to the United States where she was an adjunct professor at what was then Cornell Medical College and became head of the cell ecology lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She began building an international reputation in the 1960s with research into the functions of the immune system's organs, in particular the thymus and its T cells. Dr. D'Souza explained how these cells could rearrange themselves in other organs like the digestive tract. This finding also helped show that if the cells were injected into the blood, they could then naturally make their home in different parts of the body. She then narrowed her focus to investigating the immune system's role in resisting iron poisoning, studying patients with an iron overload. In the mid 1980s, Dr. D'Souza returned to Portugal where she used her iron toxicity research to focus on hereditary hemochromatosis. That disease can cause joint pain and weight loss, but in its most acute form, it can also lead to liver cancer or diabetes. At the same time, she pushed for the creation of Portugal's first doctoral program in biomedicine, setting up the graduate program on basic and applied biology at the University of Porto. 
Having kept a home in New York, she also started the American Portuguese Biomedical Research Fund, which supports young researchers. Dr. de Souza, who has no immediate survivors, received one of Portugal's highest honors, the Grand Cross of the Order of St. James of the Sword in 2016. Okay, I'd like to introduce my guests. I've been looking forward to this conversation. We've had to reschedule it once. I had my microphone off. I almost wasn't going to be able to be heard, but now here we are, and let me introduce them to you. Joao Machado has been a research fellow in history of science and technology since 2012, and since 2020, a PhD candidate in history, philosophy, and heritage of science and technology at the Nova School of Science and Technology. His project is concerned with computing in Portugal in the 1980s, linking the framing of computing as a wider social concern with the new development perspectives opened by the 1974 democratic revolution in Portugal. Inés Navallas is a PhD candidate in history, philosophy, and heritage of science and technology at Nova School of Science and Technology. Her thesis concerns science communication in a Portuguese book collection focused on science and technology. She's recently working in a European project called News Era related to citizen science as a new form of science communicating and enjoy also an, a European project regarding science journalism in Europe. Tiago Sariva might be joining us in a few moments. Tiago has been a frequent guest on COVID calls. He's an associate professor of history at Drexel University and the author of Fascist Pigs, Techno-Scientific Organisms and the History of Fascism. And Hugo Suarez is a PhD candidate in history, philosophy and heritage of science and technology, also at the new University of Lisbon. His dissertation project studies the development of the Portuguese scientific research system after the 1974 democratic revolution. And he's also been developing work in material culture and scientific instruments. Joao, Hugo, Inej, thank you so much for making time to join me on COVID calls. Well, thank you for having us, Scott. Thank you. Yeah. It's always nice to see you again. <laughs> Likewise. And um, thanks also, I know we had to reschedule this, this call. It would have been a quite different discussion had we had this in the late fall than having it now, because Portugal's really been through something. I'd, I'd like to start out the way I usually do, just find out where you're calling in from and how the pandemic is looking there today. Ines, let me start with you, please. Yeah, so actually, I just, I live across the river that Hugo and Joan lives, live. So I live in Almada, uh, it's the other side of the Tagus River, and I'm close uh, to Joan and Hugo. Um, in Almada, just everything is, I guess, the same as Lisbon. Um, and everything is closed for several months now. So I'm at home like uh, about a year ago. <laughs> so yeah, I just lost the count. <laughs> so, and Joao, what's your, what's your experience right now? Same lockdown, you're in, in Lisbon yeah. or are you outside of Lisbon? Yeah, we're both in Lisbon, me and Hugo, and we have been in lockdown for about, uh, I don't know, two months maybe. Uh, it's been a very hard lockdown. Uh, it's the second time we've been locked down, like full on lockdown. But this time was preceded by the start of a real uh, wave of cases when compared to the first one. So it was a bit scarier, I guess. And now it's a bit open-ended, but we think it will last until Easter, maybe. And are you able to go in at all to the university to or to the library to do any kind of work at all? Or this is a real complete, you're at home. Yeah, yeah. So you get out to do your shopping, your basic supermarket shopping, and you come home and that's it. That's pretty much it, yeah. Yeah, you can walk. I mean, yeah. you can, I mean, yeah. you can yeah, take you a can. walk. <laughs> yeah, of course. We're not in the house arrest, but that's but everything is closed. So limited. And I, I think, you know, in the United States, that was the experience. It was a shared experience for many people, but really only in the month, month of March and April for most people. And then the yeah. relaxation of the, of the summer started. Hugo, what's your experience at, at this time? You're also located in Lisbon. What? Yeah, uh, in central Lisbon. So, but this this lockdown is on the national level. So, 
uh, when things started to get uh, a bit uglier, there were some more uh, localized uh, measures. So we couldn't, uh, for a while we were in semi-lockdown, so we couldn't exchange, uh, we couldn't travel very far, but we had, we could go to the restaurant with some rules. And now we are in complete lockdown. Uh, so I mean the last months of my thesis and the archives are closed, the libraries are closed. Um, you cannot, oh, let me just change my, my mic. No problem. We had only just a, a small crackle there. <laughs> At least you have yours on. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Is it better yeah. now? Yeah, it's yeah. better. Okay, yeah. I can, compl I can, I can complain a little bit more. <laughs> just to follow up on, yeah. on that. So we had, um, yeah, we had Christmas and we were able to uh, go home to our families and with all cares. Um, and afterwards it came the, apparently the backlash and now we're, we're closed, we're locked down. And it's uh, at least psychologically, although it's basically the same type of lockdown that we had earlier in 2020. It feels much uh, heavier, and we are very tired of this. <laughs> <laughs> Just to follow up for a second, that um, this second wave, the the lockdown uh, that you're in right now, what's the consensus, Hugo? Let me start with you on this. What's the consensus about that? It's really that there was a sort of broad opening up of that Christmas. People traveled around a lot. There was international travel, perhaps. And then that's the that's the impact by January. Or there's something else at work there. Um, the the narrative uh, of our authorities are not very consensual. So before Christmas, we had some limitations because the UK strain was already known. So some limitations were made on the on the flights from the UK. Um, but the the new variants, the mobility on Christmas. Uh, New Year, which although uh, it was forbidden to have celebrations, it's well known that that wasn't uh, strictly followed. So the consensus is that this mix of factors um, caused certainly this uh, this wave. But which one was the more prevalent? Which one was the more important? It's not so far uh, settled. So it's probably something that's, that's going to be looked at again in a few months when more data is available. Joel, to bring you in on this, some of the reporting I've read indicated it was not only about the spread, but also a sort of fatigue that had been building in the health system. So it was harder for the health system and the hospitals to respond, um, which was part of the story as well. I, I guess I want to ask you about, you know, your sense of how the health system has been performing throughout this. Well, we know now that in the first um, wave, um, there was a lot of concern, of course, but uh, a lot of patients were admitted out of an abundance of caution. So the situation we have now is completely different. Uh, there was a real big fear of reaching peak capacity in a very short period of time. So uh, whatever happened there, if it's the factors that Hugo is talking about, which is which are kind of sustained by the Minister of Health and the Prime Minister, um, we could see that for a few weeks uh, the cases were blowing up, and the, the 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 really difficult part is the ICU capacity. So it was really raising to a limit that was not sustainable. So uh, right now, that's one of the targets. It's for the lockdown uh, to raise to, to lower the cases to an acceptable level. But uh, generally, I think people think that the system is performing rather well. They we had the idea that uh, in Portugal the crisis could be really big if no measures were taken. So that that I think that was a huge part of how people accepted the restrictions so far. And let me take you back, as you said, you've been in, when you've been in lockdown twice, time starts to move in, in mysterious ways. But Ines, let me bring you back to the earlier period. And, you know, you're an expert in science communication. I'm, I'm really curious how you thought the government did in terms of communicating 
the risk. It's a particular risk communication problem for that time because next door in Spain, you've got what's broadly seen as an international, I mean, it's being paid attention to by the international news media, but you were having a different experience in Portugal. It's sometimes in the United States, it was very hard for health officials if there weren't cases in the city around people, it was hard to communicate that risk. I'm curious how they approach that in, in Portugal and your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I kind of have a, a different opinion from João. <laughs> so I think that, um, of course, people are more concerned in this second wave, but I, I guess um, the, the bigger concern were um, that I think the narrative is like the the guilt. It's like a it's, it's a guilt around the citizens. So if you, it was a, a bit of controversy at Christmas time because the government gave uh, into the pressure and let the Christmas be celebrated as a family, um, but remembering clearly that there was that should be con uh, restraints. But uh, it seems interesting to me that the idea that remained in the public was that the government left and then we did it. So the government left and I just spent Christmas with my parents. I didn't even see the rest of my family or friends and I spent the year alone. So there's a, le there's a, a bit of a lack of uh, self-responsibility. So obviously yeah. the government has a role, but I guess we must not forget that we decide what to do. So I continue to see even after this wave, people walking on streets full of people without a mask. So I guess mm. it's, it sounds inconceivable for me. Um, and as I was saying, it's up to us to decide what we will be and what will be the best thing for us. Um, but in, I guess right now what happened, what is happening in the media, uh, is that they have, and they know they have an enormous power, and is is true that the most the most of the people, most of people get their information through TV and general yeah. media. So it is important to give quality information, um, and that is becoming more difficult, I think. In fact, last week, a group of journalists, scientists, doctors, and science communicators got together and wrote an open letter to the various uh, TVs and addressing precisely the question of specialists who are brought on TV. So um, that there is a lack of specialists, there is a lack of physicians uh, that go to the national TV and and speak about the, this, what they are going through. Um, because on TV, from my perspective, it's not, I guess it's just political commenters. commentators. So they have their own agendas. Their agendas are very present, but uh, I mean, we have to hear these people because they they know what what is going on right now. So. I mean, it's a concern, I think. Let me, uh, Hugo, let me bring you in on this because you wrote to me in an email that that um, you've had some issues that are resonant with what Ines is talking about, but that there was sort of a Portuguese Dr. Fauci, um, uh, uh, yeah. public health, public <laughs> health <laughs> official who's made some uh, some news in his own right. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, let me compliment a little bit on uh, Ines, uh, just so you understand how uh, things were structured here. So uh, at the start of the pandemic, so after the moment we had the first cases, we started having daily briefs. Um, they were shared by several uh, entities. So it was always the Minister of Health, uh, the President of the Health Board, and sometimes another minister, like the internal administration, or depending on the, on the subject. And uh, it was always balanced, like the Minister of Health would talk about the, the measures, so the political choices made, and um, the board director uh, would talk more about the behaviors, about the characteristics of the, um, the disease. So they sort of complemented like the science, 
and the behaviors and the political part. And that went on for months straight. Um, and it worked in a very, I think, interesting tandem because they were very, very tight. They worked really well together, although it produced some tiredness. So at some point, people were getting tired of them. I believe there was also some misogyny involved. Um, but at some point, the they started being criticized by the constant influx and like reciting the number of, of uh, deaths and etc. Yeah. At the same time, there started to pop up on the on the news program some commenters, some po politicians, but also some uh, now to be celebrity yes. uh, represent representatives of some areas, like the um, the order of doctors, the order of infirm uh, of uh, nurses, yeah. and a couple of. Um, virologists, pneumologists. So there was a, a early last year a popping up of a lot of specialties, and then some of them became more well known, and some some less. Uh, the one that I said that was like uh, Dr. Fauci is the the board, uh, the director of the board of health, uh, which has I think a posture very similar because very um, almost like a teacher um, mm. and very ponderate and uh, that type of image. And she has some, some peculiarities, but we can leave it if we have time because uh, it has mm -hmm. to do with, uh, with the general look. Uh, <laughs> and uh, something she brought into the, to those meetings, which was very, I think, very peculiar and very, uh, very nice in the, in, in the, the environment. Um, and I got lost in my thoughts. Well, so, what were we talking about? Remember? Well, we're talking about <laughs> yeah, and the way that the risk is communicated to society and and the problem and and I think you've seen that we certainly saw that in the United States where yeah. um, you got sort of instant epidemiologists, the people who are basically political commentators who sort of anointed themselves as um, public health communicators uh, to varying levels of success and communicating risk as trust in government goes down is is hugely problematic. Uh, Joao, let me turn to you on this because I want to bring this sort of political layer in. What's been the political situation? And that's a little bit of a broad question, but maybe take it in two parts. Earlier in the pandemic, how were government officials being perceived by the public and the way they were handling it? And then let's take it into the into the fall as well. Maybe talk to us about that first part. Yeah, so um, I think in the the early months, it was very similar to what happened in many countries in Europe, in that uh, the government, so to explain to people who don't know the Portuguese situation, we have a, a government that's a remnant from the post-austerity period in the early to 2010s. It's a socialist minority government that's supported by parties on the left, including the Communist Party, which is kind of rare in Europe. And this is also balanced by a, a centrist president who has just been re-elected. So this is a very wide political alliance and it has been lasting for the past six years and kind of been reinforced in the early days of the pandemic. So the consensus was very broad and um, I think the popularity of the prime minister was reinforced. Uh, everything worked rather well. So I think this lasted into the summer when we started to see the first cracks. And then we had some different positions. But even in terms of opposition, the opposition supported the government for the early period. And then yeah, I just thought I just thought sorry, yeah. Scott. I just thought no, it no, was, was very interested that um, around the Christmas the controversy that the government let people go to their houses and see their family, and by that time uh, the opposition uh, parties were very uh, acceptable and they are not making uh, any kind of critic. And then, uh, as it was, it was said by all of the specialists in all of the news, um, if Christmas would happen, uh, it would be uh, like it was. So, um, after the Christmas, 
at least for me, I thought it was amusing to see that uh, a lot of uh, parties that were, that were accepting these measures, um, criticizing, criticizing that measures. So they were allowing that to happen. And then when it got critical, they were the first ones to say there was a, an error and that the, the Costa, the prime minister, would, <laughs> would have been... Uh, yeah, like it was an, uh, a mistake to do that. So they were supporting, but then after they got worse, they withdraw that support. Has that led to a, a political crisis at this time at all? I mean, what's the, it seems like the consensus would begin to fall apart a bit in, in light of what you all saw there in at this time that's had you in this sort of second lockdown. Ines, what, how would you describe the sort of confidence in the government right now? Well, I guess there wasn't a, like a conflict um, between parties, but um, I guess that there was a, um, a way for the, the, light, uh, the right left, uh, the right wing of the, of the Portuguese uh, parliament to rise. And so we had the presidentials right uh, in January, February, January. I can recall. Um, and we we have seen th that the one of the um, the candidates um, was directly from right wing and was like in second and third. So it was scary, and it still is. So it is a, a very scary time. So let's just stay with that because that's um, also been a story that. Um, has been covered pretty widely in the United States. Hugo, to you first, this sort of populism um, in the United States, it's manifest itself in some very strange forms like um, militias showing up at state houses or... Um, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't, have, we haven't you don't, had that yet. You, you don't do that, but Donald Trump uh, heroically removing his mask. I mean, the theatrics of it are very odd, but at the base of it is a hardcore populism on the right which has become incredibly vocal and violent in the United States and is connected with the pandemic. Put, give us some context of how populism has been working in, in uh, right-wing populism uh, has been working in, uh, in Portugal. Uh, here it works in a, a very dis distinctive way. Um, mm. So yes, we have a, po a populist currents emerging, but they are not uh, associated with anti-vaxxers or anti-maskers, uh, there might be some, but it's it's not. Uh, it's more on uh, talking about the responsibility of the government, talking about the mismanagement of the pandemic, um, pointing out that some people who, sh who were vaccinated shouldn't have been so. We have something very different here because we don't really have a very uh, big movement on anti-masks or anything like that. We have protests uh, to reopen the uh, economy, but it's always reopened, but with, uh, with care, so with measures. So although we had for a short time, we had a few small groups uh, protesting it was it wasn't a lot of people and it was uh, more close to conspiracy like 5g and um, <laughs> hidden mm -hmm. agendas and stuff like that but it didn't gain much traction um, I think uh, Portugal has a tradition of um, respecting the medical authority um, mm -hmm. So a doctor is still someone that you should listen to. And I think that mixed with the stability we have. And we have to consider our prime minister is a very popular and very cunning uh, politician. Mm -hmm. He's very good at mm -hmm. what he does. And so he was able to uh, go from small crisis to small crisis. And he was mm -hmm. always able to, to gather um, efforts. Uh, to continue the same policies. So uh, even though, so to, to just to wrap it up, even though we have some rise on right-wing populist movements, it's set on other issues like corruption, crime, mm -hmm. yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah. Joao, a few moments ago, you mentioned the austerity and the, uh, the sort of lingering politics of austerity in 
Portugal, I think in, in many countries in Europe, in my understanding that, um, of course, that's there as a background. And then the pandemic has provided a, a space for an anti-EU politics hmm. to emerge, uh, to resurface. Maybe it never, maybe it never goes underneath. I don't know. But could you say a little bit about how um, the perception of the EU and the relationship with Portugal within the EU is being perceived there in Portugal at this time? Well, um, because the pandemic response is so caught up with funding from the EU, uh, the criticism has basically evaporated. So, of course, we, ha we have a lot of discussion about the EU, but uh, be the, the recovery plan was widely discussed in Portugal. And the, the thing was that we were basically discussing the countries that were blocking uh, the aid, and not so much the role in the EU, which was widely known to be necessary, and um, so no one criticized it among uh, along those lines. I would say just to add to Hugo's uh, remarks that uh, I think right-wing critiques in Portugal and even in other places, of course, have focused on. Um, individual liberties, uh, the competence of state actors, and preferential treatment. So this has allowed some people to exploit, namely the, the far-right candidate that Inez was talking about, to exploit themes of corruption um, and uh, the, the differential treatment uh, in COVID measures. But this is the main line, I would say. And not so much questioning the EU or Portugal's place in the world because we, the consensus is that we are kind of stuck with the EU for now. <laughs> the, just to, Ines, let me bring you back in. I know you're working on these new projects about science communication more broadly and science journalism. I'd be interested to hear sort of some of your early findings or thoughts about that. You know, how has the pandemic um, opened up opportunities for science writers, for science journalism, what, what have been the challenges of that? I mean, I've talked to lots of reporters on COVID calls and I'm astounded with the reporting that many of them have done from their living rooms, basically. Um, <laughs> developing new sources, having distant newsrooms and still producing quite extraordinary work through this time. I'd be curious to know what you're finding in the research you've been doing. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not, really quite studying the pandemic so we are studying right now science uh, citizen science and the communication to the various stakeholders but i would say that um, in portugal we have seen a, um, a growth of job opportunities in science communication and that was not normal until now so i think maybe uh, it, it can be uh, like a, a signal of change. So I guess uh, people are, and institutions, uh, I guess they are um, aware now that, that um, this type of communication is needed more than ever. And they are beginning to understand now, I think a little bit uh, later, but okay. Um, they are beginning to understand the importance of um, specialists. And so they are, I think, uh, beginning to um, be more concerned with uh, bringing specialists and not, not so, and that's a, a big concern of mine, not so in the television, so uh, mm -hmm. where most of the people get information, but like more on um, written papers and, and online papers. Um, I guess they are bringing more, are giving more voice to specialists and physicians um, to tell their truth. So I guess there would be there will there will be a lot of work in science communication in the next years because the pandemic gave us a new way a new point of view of mm -hmm. science and I would say that I mean I think the main problem was in the beginning of uh, the pandemic um, a thing that I I also find on my thesis is that. Um, 
in Portugal, the public opinion does not realize uh, what is the scientific process. So um, it, it has been found and still is believed that when you know something, that thing is the same forever and is never changing. So the government was criticizing the beginning for saying, for example, that the disease will not get here and it, it arrived a month later. So, mm -hmm. uh, and there was no masks, but then in the meantime, it was noticed that uh, it was. And so I guess from the citizen's point of view, this, is, was, this was not explained. And this started to seem very unorganized because they did not realize that they were, that we are all unaware of this and we are learning by doing. So mm. this, this is a, a big uh, problem, I think. I'm really glad that you raised that because that's been um, people I've spoken with you know, here in the United States you know, have raised this, this same problem. You know, communicating uncertainty, which in a sense is what science reporting is, um, is fine on a, a normal day, but when people perceive that their lives on the line, that uncertainty and that open discussion of the uncertainty, which I think Dr. Fauci in the United States did a pretty good job with, um, it is startling and, and infuriating, I think, to many people in the public who want an answer, not, yeah. uh, a discussion of uh, how the study is going. I just want to remind everyone that you're listening to COVID calls, and I'm talking today with Hugo Suarez, Joao Machado, and Inés Navalles about COVID-19 in Portugal. And the four of us got acquainted first because we started a research project together, which situates current events in a sort of deeper history of disaster in Portugal. And I'd like to turn to that a little bit now. Jo uh, Joao, let me ask you first about the way that a sort of broader history of disease, of pandemics, maybe particularly the AIDS crisis, for example, how that's um, resonating at this time. You know, there's always the echoes of previous disasters in the current day, and I'm curious how previous pandemics or health crises are referenced today in Portugal. What kind of background um, does that bring to the discussion of COVID-19? Well, <laughs> that's a tough question because um, I'm I have been helping my my dad with a memoir of his work on AIDS. Uh, his his work with uh, infectious diseases for most of his career mm -hmm. focused on AIDS, and now he's a uh, is a uh, is the director of an emergency service in uh, one of uh, Lisbon. Uh, one of Lisbon's hospitals, uh, so he's is now living with the pandemic, but he is dealing with the pandemic. But he had this short retirement period last year when he wrote this, um, and this is our these are like you know a doctor's uh, memoirs. So these are very technical, focused on uh, novelty cases and weird uh, cases. But uh, as I read it, it was it was very interesting because um, we used to talk about AIDS, um, mostly about prevention, but not really talking about what was going on inside the hospitals. And it's not very usual to for doctors to write memoirs about that. So the the really interesting part for me was the the connection to all kinds of uh, social ills. And also the way the the way AIDS exposed uh, people to a, a lot of new diseases and, and all, actually a lot of old diseases that came back if, because of AIDS. Just to give you an example, uh, multi-resistant tuberculosis, uh, which led to uh, negative pressure rooms being installed in this hospital. Um, it was something that was not really forecast in the 90s, and then suddenly it had to be dealt with. And sometimes we don't see those remnants from uh, these, these other crises. Uh, for example, we used to think about SARS as not re really leaving a mark on the world or in Europe, but a lot of uh, the structure for uh, fighting uh, pandemics, as we know it, comes from those times, or even the the flu pandemic in the in 2009 and these are not really talked about so 
I think this merits some attention. And also, uh, there's not there's a lot of discussion now about long COVID. Mm -hmm. Probably talked about it a lot in this in this show, but you can see already that some people will have more COVID problems in the future, even after being healed and being all right. These will be long term problems, and the the health system will have to absorb absorb that as well. Just to stay with this for a second, can, can you tell us your father's name? It's my name, actually. Okay. <laughs> we have the same name. <laughs> OK. Uh, so in case, because sometimes people might want to go and, and check out his, his sort of you know, history as a, as a physician, I just want to ask you a follow up to that, because I had a COVID calls, which I talked with my father, and it was a really profound conversation, uh, conversations among siblings and among parents and children, of course, um, are always interesting to me, but particularly in pandemic times, what's it been like to work on a collaborative project with your father in the middle of a lockdown? Well, uh, to be sure, it's his project. Yeah. He's, he's allowed me to see it and review it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but <laughs> but not, I mean, that's not how it works. I, I would just say that um, emergency doctors, and I think it's also his kind of specialty, uh, infectious diseases, uh, I think they have a very operational profile. So the way he's been describing the pandemic to me, uh, even this day, so uh, he had to deal two week, uh, a few weeks ago with uh, the crisis in the Lisbon periphery, is very, he says basically that they, really don't, they don't really have time to discuss the overall situation, where things are going. They only have the, their single concern is getting beds, <laughs> um, passing uh, patients to the back, back line, and having more beds, having more conditions. So it is very interesting to see him reflect on the, the actually a lot of mistakes and other things about the, a pandemic that, if you think about it, was very slow when compared to COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. Things unfolded very, very slowly. And the way people processed information was also much slower, right? I mean, today uh, I'm asking him about the UK variants and right. he, he doesn't know a lot about that yet, you know? Let me bring Hugo in on this, on some of your work. You're an expert in the way that the country post-1974 developed. Uh, <laughs> you can own it, you gotta own it. Uh, <laughs> the, developed the, uh, <laughs> It's a scientific research complex. And I'm curious, maybe you can connect that a little bit to what's happening now, the overwhelming amount of um, COVID research, which has uh, globally, which has come out in this last year. I'm sort of curious how you see the Portuguese um, research system broadly defined now in the context of the deeper history that you, that you know about. Yeah, well, uh... Well, I have the, the focus problem, which uh, is I know more about 30 years ago than the system today, which, which is which is normal. But uh, there are some things that are... So we had a system that was developed um, slowly, but in the last 20 years, it started expanding at a very rapid rate. So it started expanding when we joined the European economic community and from then on it started growing a lot in the last years have been uh, incredible if you look at uh, a port, uh, country like portugal that had uh, over 40 percent uh, illiterate people um, just 50 years ago so that that is uh, an amazing development there are a lot of issues so we still have a very precarious uh, system uh, and it's that precarity is in the last, I'd say, five years has become uh, more vocal, uh, also because there is a bigger community uh, and there's also bigger ex expectations and bigger funding. So now the precarity is starting to uh, unbalance things. So we are still seeing how that will work out. Uh, with the pandemic, there have been also some some experts who have uh, been critical of the the research system that have emerged. 
but we can also see that the uh, our minister of science is also uh, taking the opportunity to advance more the system uh, obviously now science is even more valued than it was uh, before and they have moved very quickly in some things um especially the the funding programs so we had our first cases in march 2020 and one month later there was a, a call open for doctorates in covid research and a month later there was a collective project uh, also on covid so this was very fast and the, the results came out very fast which is something that we're not used to because yeah. you apply to a, to a funding and then it's like maybe a year from now you hear about it but it was yeah. one month and the results were in and Interestingly, there were also some complementary um, research funding, uh, which I've taken note. Uh, I think you'll find some of them interesting. So there was one um, regarding gender and COVID. There was uh, one about COVID on hate uh, crimes and violence. And there's one on artificial intelligence and COVID mm. for mm. data science in public administration. So, uh, so they some are, social science and some data science funding there as well as the yeah, more fundamental yeah. bioscience funding, huh? Yeah, although uh, these are very small, if, if you compare with the, the, the bigger projects, they are very small fundings. Uh, and also, if you look carefully, you see they, they did some reshuffling. So the, um, this call on hate crimes and violence is related to some immigration policies that were already being emanated from the European Union. The one from data science uh, is a three-year project. This is actually the third call uh, yeah. related to the development of an advanced computing okay. infrastructure we now have with Spain. And this call, they uh, switched it so <laughs> completely now it's Right. Yeah. And this one for gender uh, and COVID is also related to other initiatives that were already uh, important. Mm. So there was some reshaping uh, and, and refunding. So, uh, and also one, one thing that is new about this is that uh, they also created the platform. Um, so you, you can keep up with the projects. Uh, that's, mm. I find, I found uh, very new. Uh, because usually when we have a project, the project itself has to do its own uh, communication and its own outputs. In this case, there's a platform and you can see all the projects, how they are evolving, how they are. Um, and I also should mention that they all have a, a very practical uh, character. Mm -hmm. they, they're all about dealing with the pandemic now, dealing with managing the pandemic now. Uh, helping the uh, NHS. So these are really uh, interesting uh, mm. funding lines. Let's see where this will lead. Maybe in a couple of months, we have some indication if this has any uh, long-term impact. It's a, it's, it's a change. Really <laughs> interesting and underlines um, the value of uh, the kind of work that you do that um, you found out that the research line, which was called something else, has been repurposed as a COVID research line <laughs> or some research funding. And that's that's interesting yeah, because it shows that a research system can be somewhat responsive to events, um, yeah. which I think is yeah, important. I should, I should just say that uh, there wasn't much research involved. So the, um, <laughs> the description of the project states the they have to state where the um, so where, do, where does the money come from? And so it's easy to, to spot these things. It's not hidden. It's easy to follow the money. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, you don't I, have to really follow it. <laughs> I want to ask you all about, uh, Ines, I'm going to start with you about the environmental politics at this time. It's really fascinating to me um, and continues to be how, how much doom and gloom there was about international efforts to mitigate climate change the last COP meeting and, and with the United States under previous presidency pulling out of the Paris Agreement. And then what was demonstrated in March and April around the world was a sort of massive collective action, um, which had environmental implications nobody would have wished 
for that, certainly. But it was interesting from an environmental perspective. And in, in every country I've looked at, it resurfaced environmental debates around climate change and, and around sort of the national picture in relation to the global picture. And Ash, let me bring you in first on this, sort of things you've noticed about the environmental politics discourse in Portugal at this at this time? Well, recently, actually. Um, so we haven't had, from my perspective, we haven't, we haven't had information about um, environmental policies in recent times. However, um, in, I think you were here uh, at the time of the, the design of construction, of construction, the new airport outside of Lisbon. I don't know. I think so. So the construction of this new airport, which was designed for Montijo, uh, also on the south bank of uh, Tagus River, was, was denied due to environmental reasons just uh, two or three years ago uh, because it threatened the species of that place. However, um, and taking advantage of the fact that I think let me guess, stop runaway flights um, we had uh, and take the opportunity to keep this issue addressed so we could stop this uh, construction um, but the government continues to look for alternatives on the south bank of the river to make the airport like this was the last week. so uh, I have not yet realized that the problem is not the location of the airport the problem is that they are not concerned with the environment with the population with the species and with the quality of life of their population and right now we can we could address this issue by not making another airport because all the flights are uh, all the the um, i don't know all the tourists are gone <laughs> yeah all the tourists are gone right the tourism has ended so, yeah yeah so we could we could address this that way and um, this is a, a concern that has been uh, in the in the media for for a long time, and just last week this was brought up again um, because uh, in 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 the beginning of the pandemic we saw beautiful images of uh, a deer coming into the city and. Mm -hmm. Uh, see, um, reaching through the cars and seeing people and dolphins in the river where they usually not going. Uh, but I think people just forgot about it. That's my point of view. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Joel, let me br let me bring you in. It's interesting how the biodiversity reappearance in the spring uh, was really startling to people and. I know you're in lockdown now, but at other times over the pandemic year, were people outdoors more? Were people using public spaces more, cycling more, taking advantage of um, sort of natural settings? Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely a thing uh, with a, you know, a warm climate. So uh, although the, the winter is very rough because we have, uh, so-called energetic poverty, uh, which is one of the reasons why the this uh, third wave is hitting so hard. Uh, we also have, you know, uh, decent conditions to have an outdoor life, and uh, cycling is part of that. In fact, the whole mobility debate is being kind of reshaped in the major, major cities. Um, and seeing the streets empty of cars, which were so defining in the planning of these cities, and seeing the planning for new cycling lanes and new green spaces uh, advance so quickly. Uh, basically, what's happening uh, in Lisbon, but also Porto and other places, uh, some places slower than others, but Lisbon is really at the forefront of this. Is really, uh, we already had a very ambitious plan to reshape mobility in Lisbon with cycling and a lot of things are being experimented during the lockdowns. And at the same time, there is a logic that is contributing to this, which is the delivery services that are spreading like crazy and driving the numbers up. So usage is mm -hmm. up because of that, because people are outside 
And for a while, there's, there is this idea that this could be really um, a good strategy uh, going forward. And the thing is, for many, many years, and this is something we are trying to work on in another project, uh, it was in, unimaginable to see this change as a system. You would think about alternative mobility as uh, something to decide. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the resilience, uh, I think Inez is talking about the big, the big infrastructure issues that connect to climate change. Uh, the, the big package of money coming from Europe uh, is supposed to touch on this, uh, these kinds of problems. Uh, and so at the same time, the money is supposed to, to go to uh, greener infrastructure. Uh, the airport was already being challenged on en environmental grounds. And now we have uh, major investments in railways and hydrogen mm -hmm. production, which is still a, bit, a little bit controversial. Controversial, but and by the way, I didn't forget that forests. <laughs> right, <laughs> there's a big chunk of the budget that goes to that. Uh, we can talk about that in a moment. But um, I think at, at at the level of policy, and since we do not have an official uh, a large green party, the major parties are taking green policy uh, into their hands. Uh, maybe not as ambitious as most people want, but still mm -hmm. some things are being done right now, especially because of this long-term planning logic that the money from the EU uh, asks for. Just a reminder that you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking about Portugal today and the pandemic. And in the time we have left, I did want to turn to the topic that the four of us have worked on together with Tiago, and that's about the forests and Portugal and the wildfires. And it's been um, something that people have been tracking the ways that the compound disasters, it's just not, it's not one plus one. It's, it's a sort of compounding or multiplying effect. So I, I'd like to, Hugo, let me bring you in first on this. What was the wildfire season like? I imagine there was a lot of concern because it's been a national crisis in the last few years, a matter of national concern. What was the concern about wildfire intersecting with the pandemic or was that not uh, much yeah, reported uh, over the there, time. There was there was some concern uh, because one of the, the the issues along the years is always keeping the the forests clean because, uh, like you like we we talked about, uh, Portugal has a very fragmented um, um, rural structure. So if you have a big forest, probably it's owned by fifty people, which have sm a small plot. So there's always the issue of cleaning um, the forest so the wildfires won't uh, happen or won't be as hard. And so there was that worry because since people were under confinement, uh, under lockdown, they, wouldn't, they weren't going to, the, to their local villages because many times people live in the city, but these terrains with forests are neglected uh, in the interior. And in fact, um, this year we had less ignitions, mm. but more area burned. <laughs> mm. So I don't know exactly what's going on here. Mm -hmm. But there is also uh, the explanation that there were less ignitions because the arsonists were also under lockdown. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is official uh, narrative. And why do they? How do they know that? Because there were less arrests by arson this year. So <laughs> I, I I am unable to put these pieces together. I as as we, you know, there's a, a bigger narrative here. But so lockdown kept people from cleaning up and kept the arsonists from spreading fires, and yet more area burned. Um, uh, I think okay. uh, Joan looked at the, um, the resilience plan and uh, he knows something about what's going to happen to the forests, maybe. I'm dodging. Yeah, no, well, that's, I mean, you've given us some fascinating clues there. And of course, looking for the arsonist when the broader um, context is there so obvious is something we an arsonist. Is always. Yeah, yeah, around the corner yeah. in Portugal, there is always an arsonist. Yeah. Well, it, <laughs> let me bring let me, either uh, Inez or Joao, do you want to come in on this? And I just want to throw up one, I don't know how helpful it is, data point, but I was looking at the stock price of Navigator, the paper yes. company, 
uh, and it has fallen off the table. Um, so the paper sector has certainly been struggling. I, I imagine they're receiving government subsidy to keep themselves going. But Joao, bringing you in on the sort of wildfire pandemic question, what have you noted? So one of the major, uh, I don't know about the wildfire season per se, because as you know, wildfire seasons can be very different. So it depends on, the, on a lot of conditions. Um, but one thing that's, that seems certain is that uh, the forest sector is going to benefit from future investments. Uh, one thing that's going forward is the, the me a mechanism for forced rent, which will allow the government to take over uh, private lands to to clean them up and manage them, uh, specifically lands in the so-called wildfire lines. So that's new. And at the same time, that's something that the industry was asking for for a long time. And the industry, as you say, the Navigator company uh, is still very strong. So this is a company that's 1% of the GDP in Portugal. Uh, it has benefited from a lot of investments over the years. Uh, you would say indirect investments. We recently found a very interesting, some very interesting news about their investment, the large investment in Mo Mozambique, um, that's slowly coming through. And we also, we also have been reading about the bills we have to pay, or some people had to pay, regarding the World the World Bank project in the 1980s. So when you talk about this, you always have to have two scales or more than one scale in mind. Um, I would yeah, say I... that right now, just to a little finishing mm -hmm. touch, uh, wildfires have become like a science and innovation issue. Everyone wants to do wildfires. There's a, there's, there, there are these uh, research, research fast track funding lines and uh, you know come to portugal if you want to research that <laughs> i think that uh, once i can get sprung from the covid trap like lots of other people uh that would be probably the first place i would travel to to continue oh no 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 no, no 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 i didn't mean historians i didn't mean historians oh not for historians <laughs> no, not for historians. Are you sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay. Because that, I, no, because I've heard they've been including because, social uh, science in it. Huh? Well, we have some we have some colleagues that can speak to that, but they don't really want historians to do that. Mm. Uh, they're more interested in risk management and that kind of okay. stuff. Okay. Well, we'll have to do it anyway, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and they'll see that they'll see the value of the analysis. We're we're almost up on time. I just I wanted to do one more quick round just to kind of check in with you um, because I do know it's it's hard enough to be a graduate student taking on big project under non-disaster times. But just to give you a, a chance, I mean, also, I mean, just as a comment, what I've observed, your community there is very tight. I mean, you all rely on each other, you know each other, you help each other. Um, it, it must be quite challenging to be so distant at this time and not be in kind of the lively shared spaces where you're, you're constantly sharing ideas. I guess I'd like to know just how you're coping with that, or how you're keeping connected with your colleagues and your and your professors. And as let me start with you. Like, how have you adapted grad student life to being in inside four walls? Well, it's not easy. But actually, uh, in this new project, New Zero, um, we just uh, finished a, a course uh, with about uh, twenty people online. Um, we uh, exposition, uh, exposition sessions and a bit of interactive work uh, in the the afternoon. So it is a bit challenging, um, and for me to work at home is a lot of uh, it's difficult. And I'm very tired right now because it has been a year or so, and I think what Ugu was saying in the beginning is that um, it's it's actually difficult to see an end to this. So we don't know if tomorrow we can go to the university to study or the next year, maybe the end of the year. So it's it's a it's a, a long run, and without a 
it's it's very difficult for me. But, yeah. Hugo, just want to hear from you about this as well. I know in the final stages, yeah. in theory, you're supposed to be locked yeah, down well, anyway, writing. But it, <laughs> <laughs> it adds a layer yeah, well, of pressure, though, I would think. Uh, yes. Um, for uh, well, something proved good for me, which is I'm a bit of a hoarder of information. So I spent the, the research part of my project uh, digitizing a lot of stuff I didn't read. And now it was very useful because the archives are closed. Okay. Um, but the, the lack of contact with the colleagues is, uh, is the worst part. We can have the Zooms, but then we, can, we can't comment and badmouth people. Um, it's, it's the worst part. It's the worst part. Yeah. Yeah. Since this coincided with the with the writing part of my thesis, uh, in a sense, it could have been welcoming, but no, no. It's uh, it's very. It's always hard. good to go for a glass of wine. Just to get outdoors. Yeah. You can do that at home. Yeah. But... Oh, <laughs> alone. Yeah. yeah, but it's boring because you yeah. you. Uh, you can't go to the faculty, you can't go to the library. Uh, I used to go to the library just to get out of the house and have a schedule uh, to structure sure. my life. And now the library isn't there for me, so I have to structure myself. And that, that's, the, that's the worst part. Yeah, I have to structure yeah. myself. The last word on this to you, Joao, just how you've been coping with it. Oh, that's a really tough one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I have the advantage of not being in the final stages of the dissertation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I still take some time to participate in group discussions with people from my uh, PhD group. They are a bit ahead. And I, I, you know, I buy stuff in online auction that's relevant for me. This is about you know, magazines about computing. Yeah. Um, when I when I buy these things, I actually meet the people, so I conduct some small interviews. Uh, but it's all about the, the the little details, you know. That's that's the really hard part. The things you you get to find in libraries, just juggling different materials, the little questions you make uh, after a conference or stuff like that. And it's really well, distance isn't helping with that. So. Let's hope it gets better in the future. I, I've also been just to get get a little bit of a positive note and also to connect our research with things that are going on. I I find that in my case I'm researching uh, history of computing, so there's a lot to go about if you think about the connections to present day. Uh, one of the things we didn't discuss was the horrendous uh, app controversy when the government tried to. Uh, mandate people to download an app to do contact tracing and those kinds of things or for instance i'm now uh in in our faculty we're now thinking about uh, the the ways uh, students are being evaluated with uh, ai and stuff like that mm -hmm. and we always find some connections about the use of computer technology uh, that's really rampant these days for everything that we have to stop and question and think about the links to things that have been done before. So that's helpful to me. Well, thank I you for hosting. To, well, absolutely. I just want to remind everybody, uh, you've been listening to COVID calls and you can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. And um, I'll be making an announcement for a special COVID calls uh, on Monday in which uh, we'll be talking about Fukushima and I will have Ryoma Shineha, uh, Kota Juroku and Kyoko Sato to talk about Fukushima in the context of the pandemic in Japan. So please do join me for that. And I want to thank my guests, Hugo Suarez, Joao Machado and Ines Navalias for um, sharing this time and talking about this pandemic experience and very selfishly on my part, it's just good to see you and um, good luck um, as you're going through the rest of this year. Stay healthy, everybody, and we will see you on Monday on COVID calls. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Thank you for having us.